Hey, hello everyone. Welcome to the Global Beer Brewery Tour webinar. Um, if I can get Shahan, Dan, Christy, somebody to text me, see and hear you. Perfect. Shahan, you're ahead of the game. Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, this is Global Beer Webinar Tour. Um, it is our, I want to say fourth or fifth now. Um, since COVID has kind of taken over everything, it's our way to hopefully connect with not only our wholesalers uh, and accounts, but also final consumers, uh, beer drinkers everywhere. So please welcome today, Carl Bone from the Brewery Bone. And we are here to talk about all of your beautiful Lambics. So thank you for joining us today. Pleasure. <laughs> awesome. Okay, so I think that most of, um, you know, I, I see a lot of the attendees here today and most of them are our wholesalers, our accounts, people who uh, know you, know the brewery, have probably been there. Um, yeah. But just to kind of start out with a one-liner that is impressive no matter who you are, um, you know, the credit that you guys can take is you're the only brewery ever in existence to win uh, six consecutive gold medals at the World Beer Cup uh, in the same category, which is incredible. So for the, for the Oud Goose category. Yeah. Uh, and we were hoping this year would be the seven, right? Your dad was on, he was going to come to uh, to San Antonio yeah. this year, but yeah. and maybe next year. <laughs> yeah, it was planning to go, and uh, the samples were all sent, and we had some very very good beers um, that we sent over for the World Beer uh, Cup, but uh, yeah, didn't go yeah. through. We're here instead. <laughs> we are connecting but, instead. Yeah. <laughs> we, uh, we, this, yeah. <laughs> this photo was in what 2018 when the mm -hmm. that 108 won, which will be the yeah. last beer that we taste today. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, awesome, exactly. cool. So, obviously, very impressive brewery. You guys have uh made headlines in the brewing world, not just in Belgium but across the world. Um, and it was your dad that kind of has all of the, the claim to fame, but really just kind of go through um, the history of the brewery a little bit. Yeah. Well, um, it is my father who, who well, it was, who founded the brewery in 1975, but he actually started in 1975 and took over a small blender in, um, in Lembeck, which is where we are today, which has some history, a lot of history that goes back all the way indeed to 1680 uh, even. And so it's a, uh, my father actually started also with the idea of um, in a time that this type of beer was really not really not really that popular anymore. And so when he um, when he uh, started, it was actually with the idea, really with the goal to take over the small blender in the town where we are today, because he saw this guy was going to disappear. Um, so he started 1975, took over the blender in 1977. Um, and yeah, so you have a whole history there before um, that they also took over, um, going back all the way to 1680. So the blendery that they took over was a small, uh, it was only blending still at that time. Uh, but before, uh, between, uh, before the Second World War, it's still also brewing beer. Um, it was a bit bigger before the First World War even, but you know, the World Wars didn't really help much. Um, for that blendery and brewery back then. But that's uh, a, a different story today, let's say. <laughs> <laughs> and this here is your brother, Joss, yeah. right? You took over uh, brewing from your father when? And we technically uh, the, Yeah, officially, officially my, my brother started in 2013 and then I started in 2017. Um, but it has to be clear that um, uh, we've been working at the brewery our whole life. Um, if you look at my LinkedIn profile, you'll also see that I, I just say I work at the brewery the day I was born. Um, <laughs> yeah, simply because you know we lived right next to the brewery, um, and definitely Joss, my brother, um, he even more. Um, he came back from school when he was nine or, or eight years old, even threw his backpack in the hallway, just went straight into the brewery and and and, and just go just go in there to check out what what happened that day. Um, and he kept up with everything, and and also he's he's the one who's even was the most interested in all the technical details around beer, the, equi the, the the equipment needed for it, but also the brewing itself. Um, so he's been he's been working at the brewery uh, since very very early. Um, 
I myself you have two other siblings, right? Yeah, we I have another brother, another brother. Um he lives in the Philippines, uh, so he's not at the brewery. Um <laughs> and then I have a sister, uh, and she's she's she also used to help mostly on, on like graphic design, these kind of things, uh, but she also does something else today. Um yeah. Awesome. Yeah, but it took, uh, it took some it took some more time compared to just to like really decide let's go for let's go for the brewery but you know in the end yeah. it's lived next to it our whole life so it's part of part of who we are so it's a natural decision for us to to continue it yeah well it's nice too because you guys found two distinct paths too right it's not like you both wanted to be in the breweries all day it's not like you both wanted to be traveling sales marketing so it's nice that you guys kind of found separate paths that really complement each other and yeah, we're, we're we're definitely not the same person my brother and i um we, we get along very well um, but we have different ways of looking at things. He's he's very much more technical than I am. I am probably more uh, maybe a little bit more emotional or maybe a bit more. Uh, uh, I have more. Let's, let's definitely say I have more feeling with with the, the psychological side of of people, which is which helps yeah. to understand markets and so on and understand the um, and the feeling around beer, you know. Um, Whereas he's really the he's the person uh, that needs to be responsible for the, the beer. That's important. <laughs> it's very I would perhaps do it as well, but uh, he 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 goes into detail even much more. So um, so we have a good a good fit there. Yeah. It's perfect. So the the really cool thing that I you know I I learned a lot of a lot of what I know of Lambic um, in, in the past, but learning so much more since obviously you guys came into our portfolio uh and one really cool thing about your dad before he started this brewery was that he ran a distributor in belgium correct what really the first distributor as as here in the states as we look at distributors yeah yeah so indeed so the, the what he actually did so in 1975 he started as a blender um to take over the, the and, and and his goal was to take over the blendery in lembic and then eventually grew it into a brewery and to 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 keep this lambic style alive. Now, as I said, it wasn't really a thing that 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 um, that was very popular. Lambic was not a popular um, beer back then. And so um, the the problem um, that he faced was also a financial one. So he needed to find another way to sell his beer, sell lambic beer. And the way he did that was by going around Belgium, driving around Belgium, um, going to different towns, and just go to each brewery in each town because it was much more like that like that back then that every town had its own brewery um and would really just distribute to that town correct uh no so he actually uh, he, he focused on buying the beers from the different towns and then instead of well he didn't sell in those towns but then he mostly sold in brussels but with a whole portfolio of typical regional beers from different regions in belgium um and sold those as uh, as, a, as a Belgian specialty beer in Brussels in Brussels bars and and he was the first person to actually um, use this term also uh, uh, together with a retailer where uh, to which he sold uh, a whole range of beers biggest retailer today in Belgium um, and they pitched the, the name specialty beers for these beers which is a common name today but it's uh, it's actually very it, I think that the title on the slide says pioneer and I think it's completely yeah. appropriate in this case he was the first person to do this uh, obviously he was getting copied quite quickly uh, only a few years later by a lot of people even people with a bit more money so they could expand their business even quicker than him but it yeah. allowed and that was a goal to finance uh, the blendery and eventually the brewery yeah that's awesome and so I think we touched on this the last time, but so when he took over from Rene Davids, he was the, Rene was at, oh God, sorry. Was it that, <laughs> wrong decor. Uh, was at that time the only remaining Lambic blender in Lambic? Yeah, so, so Mr. Davids was the last blender in Lambic. Uh, not coincidentally, Lambic is called Lambic. Uh, <laughs> Um, there it have been no different than when you say it. When I say lambic and lambic, it sounds very different. It sounds no different when you say it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it was it was the last remaining blender there, and uh, there have been there were more blenders before, but it's uh, and lambic was actually even a, a big um, a, a, a town, but that's that's hundreds of years before that even uh, for um, uh, distilling because it was a, a free town 
um, independent of uh, um, of uh, well, Belgium didn't even exist back then as a, as a country, but it was an independent state where there was no excise tax and so on. Um, there was a lot of uh, brewing and distilling activity uh, in the long history, well, long ago. But then in the end, uh, De Witt was the only person still blending and doing some, something with a uh, alcoholic beverage. And uh, yeah, so my father did not want him to disappear. So uh, yeah, indeed. That's awesome. So I want to kind of go through a bit about just as an as an overview. Yeah. Uh, what is a lambic beer? Because it gets thrown around a lot. You know, we see uh, we see American breweries, you know, launching their lambic line or this and that. And you know, what is the difference between a true lambic beer and a recreation here in the states or in other parts of Europe? And uh, you know, down to bitter bones, like what is a lambic? Yeah, it's a very good question. A very uh, important question also. And as you say, there's a lot of uh, beers being inspired today by Lambic and so um, in a few things as you say here it's 40% unmalted wheat, 60% malt um, and you need aged hops. Uh, we're not looking to make a hopped beer with fresh hops. Um, the hops are there just to add, um, well first of all um, for the bacteria, bacteria aesthetic effect so this means for preserving the beer over time to helping it do this over time. Um, and you always get a little bit of bitterness from hops e either way so also you have to select the right hopping also to get this bitterness just right which creates some nice complexity not too much bitterness but just a bit um, and of course um, I'm just going through what's on the slide first um, so and of course also a cool ship uh, so the beer after being boiled uh, so it's it's brewed according to uh, the turbid mesh method in the brew house which is also a uh, particular uh, way of brewing and secondly the beer will be after boiling cooled down on the cool ship but more importantly um, the cool ship is not necessarily um, I mean cooling down a beer you can do this also with other in other ways the point is to pick up wild yeasts from the environment so we're trying to pick up um, well no we're not trying we're actually doing it um, wild yeasts from our environment so we open up windows we start a ventilator um, which you actually see on the picture, it's like this black, this black box uh, against the wall. Um, and this way we create an air current, pulling in fresh air from outside um, and pulling in uh, yeast from outside. This way the beer, the, 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 the lambic will be inoculated by these wild yeasts, which are unique to the region. Um, and these wild yeasts will, if you actually look uh, 40, well, 12, like, mid count, um, in a couple of hours, so the beer is on, on the cool ship for about five hours, and then when it's being pumped to the fooders after this, so to our, local, to our oak casks, you will easily count already 10 million uh, cells per milliliter, which is uh, a lot of cells. Um, and after that, you can even go up to 20 million. If you, uh, depending on, depending on the certain brews, it can go up to 100 million cells, which is a crazy amount of cells. It's a bit too much, but it can happen. This is just to show that um, uh, these, these yeasts, the, one, the moment they go, on, they go on there, they exponentially start growing and, and then they start fermenting the beer, of course. And timing uh, also has a lot, has a big, uh, is a big contributor, right? You don't, you don't brew in the summer months, correct? So we brew only in the cold period between uh, October and April. Depends on the weather. That could be maybe the first week of May that we're still brewing. It needs to mm. be cold at night, at least below, it has to be below 10 degrees Celsius at night. Um, during the day, it could be more, it could be hotter, it's no problem, but it, it needs to be cold at night so that uh, the, the yeast don't get uh, the time to get to, to evolve too quickly in the environment. Um, if you would brew during summer, you could have uh, uh, an overgrowth of bacteria which could create well, acetic, acetic acidity uh, or um, uh, like tastes of burnt rubber, these kind of things. That's mm -hmm. not what you want. But the reason that it's typical for the region has to do with these wild yeasts. And then, of course, um, the beer is called Lambic. For us, this is the beer from our region. Um, and this is the spontaneously fermented beer from our region. Now, I'm not saying you can't do spontaneous fermentation anywhere else. It's definitely prob well, probably possible somewhere else as well. But you'll never get the same results simply because these wild yeasts um, every it could be like um, 
we're using breath, breath, breath yeasts are in the environment. They're, those are the most well-known, the very important ones. Um, you will find breath yeasts in other parts of the world too. But uh, a yeast cell, the way it is built up, it's it, the, the, it's um, built up of different enzymes, and these these could vary. Uh, so you can have a cell from the same family, but it can vary between different types. I mean, even with the virus, you see it today. I mean, there's not the, the COVID virus today is not the same one in Belgium as it is in, in the United States. There right. is there is mutations. You see, yeah. and so it's it's the same thing a little bit with. Uh, it's maybe a bit of a, a very uh, quick uh, comparison, but it is in a way uh, a good comparison, uh, just to show that. Also, these 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 uh, these uh, wild yeasts vary from region to region, um, and the ones we have here give the taste that we have here. So if we don't we don't really like it if if someone say they're brewing some spontaneously fermented beer in let's say Texas, Los which is Angeles, very different okay. than Florida, yeah. I think and we then, have like a, a two week brewing period here. <laughs> okay, exactly. <laughs> Exactly, and but maybe there is a brewing period, and maybe it could work. But then call it maybe a cool ship ale, or give it a name that is that refers to your region, which which would make it so much more uh, worth a lot more, in my opinion, because it's 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 it, then it shows that you're making something from your region that's 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 so much more valuable than just copying something and then calling it something that it is not. So that's that's important to understand that the beers that we make here. Uh, even more than, than some wines would claim to be in France, for example, um, are really, really linked to 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 the the region. Yeah. Sorry, very, I'm having um, very important uh, slide in the, in the presentation. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. I'm having some some technical difficulties because I'm trying to show the questions uh, okay. next to the presentation. That's why I keep flipping back and forth. Um, so the one really the one thing that I, I wanted to focus on specifically, because I think limbics are romanticized a lot, especially here in the US, right? You see people hoarding on, especially right now, like doing their cellar cleaning during COVID when they're stuck at home. You see people hoarding onto um, to Lambic bottles, aging them forever, and there's certainly that part of it. But I think part of the romance that people imagine in their head before going to Belgium is, you know, walking to this brew house and you've got the same spider web in the corner since 1988 and and that is not your brewery that is i wanted to show this picture here specifically because it is beautiful and clean and precise it is it is as much of a science as it is an art the thing is um with lambic beer it is um, perhaps even more difficult to get consistency than any other beer and uh, the way to get consistency is to be hygienic. So you need hygiene in a brewery to be clean. You need to be able to control the, the, the everything because there's one thing we can't control and that's the environment uh, in which our, we have our, our wild yeast. So we have wild yeast coming onto the beer, but everything else, all these installations, we can control. And we need to get all these things right to make the best quality in this beer and to make consistency. You can perhaps use, uh, it's very romantic and a very nice view, of course, to work with a cast iron mesh ton and some copper boiling vessels and bronze um, valves and all these kind of things. But of course, talk to any other brewer and he will explain to you all the problems with this. It's the same for Lambic. Um, you don't want metal taste in your in your beer because there's metal, literally metal coming off your equipment and going into, no, you need stainless steel equipment. Um, closed systems, you need to avoid oxygen pickup, you need to control temperatures, it's all so important for any beer, so also for Lambic, and it's really not to be underestimated. And yeah, there is this romantic view, uh, an image of Lambic beer probably has to do, it's because some sort of, because of some uh, uh, Goethe Museum in Brussels perhaps, where, where you get this uh, image, um, but they're a museum too. Uh, and, it, and it's for a reason that they're called that way. It's it is it's there is a history, of course, but there is also the the technical side. And if you want to make a beer that just you know you can put it buy a crate, put it in your cellar, or buy a box of, of of bottles, and you're sure each time it's good. Then you need this installation. Yeah, absolutely. How compared to the other uh, brewers? In Lambic, how what is like the size comparison? Are you guys one of the biggest in terms of hectoliters produced? 
for traditional lambic beer, yep. we're the biggest producer. Um, okay. There are producers of lambic beer who make sell more beer, um, but then it's non-traditional beers, um, beers to which um, it's a blend of, for example, lambic and pilsner together with some, some other things to make fruit beers and so on. But in pure traditional beers, which is Oude Geuze, uh, Oude Krieg and so on, we're actually the, the biggest producer. So in total, our own brands, it's uh, 15,000 hectoliters. Um, US gallons, I'm not able to calculate that really quick, honest, but, um, <laughs> but we're also just, you know, it's, we're not we're not the biggest brewery either. I mean, but if you would put it into comparison, we're like the biggest brewery or a big brewery amongst small breweries, but we're a small brewery amongst bigger breweries. So it's like yeah. in between. Yeah. And I think the the an important distinction to make is the difference between a brewer blender and just a blender. Because I think what a lot of people don't realize is that some of their favorite lambics are not actually brewed there. They are simply blenders. Yeah, it's it's, it's also an historical thing uh, where where a lot of um, bars in the past, and I'm talking about the Santiago um, used to buy lambic from breweries, and then they would have different lambics in their in their cellar in different wooden casks even um, before mm -hmm. even before the time of, uh, of of stainless steel barrels or aluminum barrels or whatever. These would be um, and they would start blending this just to pro probably to fill up their their casks and just give back an empty cask, and then you're blending and then you're making your own blend. And this way, you know, you know, blenders came along. Um, and then today you actually still have blenders. It's it's and it's and it's really the only profession. It's not a restaurant or a, or a bar uh, per se. It's just a blender. So these are the people would these these guys would buy lambic from us, um, from and uh, from a few other lambic brewers. Um, it's 50% uh, of all the lambic used for by blenders comes from our brewery. Um, yeah, and um, yeah, it's it's an important factor of course because. You have to understand that, of course, we brew and we blend, um, but uh, it's, brewing itself is not to be underestimated. It's if you have don't have good beer to to blend with, it's not worth blending even. You need to good brew and a good beer to start with, and it starts with the raw materials growing on the so on a certain soil. You have to start all the way over there. It's really where it starts. It's the raw material, right selection getting the malt made to our own specifications. So we don't buy standard malt, we buy, we buy malt that is uh, malt to our specification. We simply call it lambic malt. Um, but it's only uh, us doing this um, because it's our specific um, specifications. Um, you have to make sure your water is all right, that your hops are all right, um, your wheat is all right. And then of course the whole process, the brewing process and everything else is, 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 is done correctly. Um, and that this is this is a lot of science uh, that goes behind it, but it's 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 very important and really not to be underestimated. And and, and again, uh, talk to any other brewer. I mean, um, there's this one thing, this very romantic thing about lambic beer, um, that is maybe not part of, of 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 most breweries that make just that well just top fermented beers. Um, of course, you have this aging, the blending, and so on. And so very, it's all mm. it's it is all fun. It's a, it's it's, yeah. it's a very creative process too, but we're also brewers, of course, and 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 in the end, in that in that in that way, uh, a lot of principles are the same for for breweries, um, for any brewery. I, in my in my non uh, humble opinion, it is the most impressive thing you can do, right? Yeah, anybody can brew. A lot of people can brew a beautiful beer one time. It's doing the same beer over and over again. And that also is what is so impressive about your, not only just the brewing side of it, but also the blending and the aging. Uh, and as we'll, we kind of get into your fooders and, and yeah. the actual blends of knowing what to blend, uh, when to yeah. do it, like all of that and doing it consistently is incredible. That That is the impressive part to me, not doing it one time, but doing it for years and years and years. But also there, it's important to know that there is, there is already starts with brewing. If you brew consistently and you're doing all those things right, in a way you're gonna help yourself when you're blending because your beers, you're gonna be able to rely on the beer that's in the fooders. The casks will give their own taste, their own expressions as well, but you're still working with a good quality beer and that is very important. 
if you have very, a lot of uh, quality issues in a beer and you put it in a cask to age, you know, a cask is not like a magical box that if you put something in a cask, it means it's going to be good when it comes out. You need to put something good in there as well. It needs to be all plus, 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 plus. It needs to be all good, all the way. And so if you if you um, blend beers that are from in a cask but that weren't brewed correctly that issues, you taste this. And, and there are definitely um, beers from, from other producers, I'm not going to call names, of course, but that where we can just say, like, look, this is a problem either with the cask or it has something to do with a brewing issue um, and so on. And these are the things you have to avoid, of course. Um, right. And that's where, where modern equipment does come in, uh, and very importantly, and, and, and science uh, comes in. We had to do a lot of our own research on this type of beer too, because it's very, uh, well, very niche. Um, but we, we do a lot of research on a daily basis just to figure out small things, like we taste something in beer, where does this taste come from? What right. what creates this taste? That's and right. it can come from a lot of things. And you have to understand all this. So I want to take a step back for a second and just talk about the region. So Halle, Belgium, these are pictures of our uh, the last time I was there with you, which was, I believe, two years ago now. Uh, so you grew up in Halle, correct? You still live there? Yeah, I'm in Halle right now. <laughs> so that yeah. picture there in the center is the church that we got to climb. Uh, some of us, if you can see our friends from Hawaii here, taking a little rest afterwards. <laughs> So climbing this church, going up to this cathedral, it is a beautiful, quaint, small town that you would that is what about 20 kilometers south, 30 kilometers south of Belgium or Brussels? Uh, yeah, some 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 20 kilometers uh, southwest of Brussels, exactly. And what yeah. was it like growing up there? Uh, well. Um... Well, Halle is, is 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 like the, the the bigger city center, and then Lembeck, where where we have the brewery, is like a commune of the, of the of the city, and so mm -hmm. it's a part of of Halle. Um, well, growing up there, it's it's a nice it's a nice city. It's not a large city either. I mean, Halle is, uh, I think, just shy of forty thousand inhabitants today. Um, but it's a nice small town, you know, uh, nice bars too. Unfortunately, they're closed today, but. Uh, uh, and I and I live right. I mean, five minutes walk from that church. So, uh, also five minutes walks for, for walk from all those bars, as you know. <laughs> so, you know, it's, you know, nice time for you know. The, it's just a very enjoyable place to grow up and then also to live. I have to say. We yeah. have to give a shout out to our friend. This is the owner of the Parliament, right? Frank. I can't remember his name. Remind also, me. Frank. Yeah. He is amazing. Uh, and this was honestly, truly one of the best charcuterie boards. Dan Lehman sent me this photo and it doesn't do it justice quite enough, uh, but really beautiful town. Uh, and the thing that impressed me when you, you walk through Hala and you are looking at people outside on the sidewalks, they are drinking the goose yep. bottles. They are, it is not something that is delicate and that they're putting in their cellar. It is a beer that they are drinking and there are a few things more refreshing on a hot day in Belgium. Well, it is, it is, and it, you know, it's an, it's an everyday beer too. I mean, if you just go into a town here, you'll see, as you say, people drinking, or well, not, not today maybe, but at home, you will definitely see it. I get, you can see it on social media. They're drinking this beer. It's, yeah. it's the beer from the region. Um, but it's it, it is still a delicate beer, of course, and it is still uh, something you can age. And you know, you will actually find people buying uh, a crate or a box of these bottles, putting it away for a time. But at the same time, they will buy another box to just drink uh, during the week. Um, we have customers just coming to the brewery or going to to uh, beer shops, bottle shops, just buying a crate every every uh, every two weeks, for example. Um, these are twelve bottle crates, by the way. <laughs> one bottle every day or every every one bottle every two days and it's it's that's that's how it is it's an everyday beer and that's why we're also i mean in perception perhaps we're not uh, from a united states point of view um, but we are the, big, the, the biggest producer of this type of beer we're selling 70 percent so it's seven zero 70 percent of our of our beer in belgium uh, and most of it is is just around uh, in our city, oh, yeah. around Brussels, uh, really just around 
near the brewery, um, 30 percent is export, and this is only since maybe three years. Three years ago, only 15 percent was export. Um, it is it is something from Belgium, typical from here. If you go to bars in Belgium, one out of three will have our beer. It's incredible. Yeah. It's, it's, We're working on that for the U.S. too. We're working on. <laughs> one of the <laughs> crazy. <laughs> Okay, we can get back to the back to the nitty gritty here of uh, you know you are of course next to this beautiful brew house you have right next door and across the river there 161 different yeah. beers. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So. <laughs> it's a lot, and they all they're all sourced from different places, um, different times. You have, I believe, this picture you told me yesterday is is the is just fresh oak, correct? Yeah, so we have we have fooders going back all the way. Um, the oldest ones that we have, my father bought those secondhand, of course, because my father was not alive in 1883. But the oldest one we have is from 1883. Um, it was always used for lambic beer, um, and that one was uh, and and well, that series was actually bought by my, my uh, by my father. Um, from another lambic blender in Brussels who went uh, bankrupt in the 80s. Um, unfortunately, quite a bit of uh, lambic breweries closed and, and went bankrupt in that time. Um, but so a lot of equipment came available too. But so we have lambic fooders from different uh, older, um, unex that don't exist anymore, uh, lambic blenders or brewers. But we right. also have barrels coming from France mostly, for mostly used for red wines. Um, a big part also with was used for Calvados uh, barrels, some cognac storage barrels, a few barrels that were actually used for Pilsner. Um, that also, um, and then there is some white 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 wine barrels, some Italian red wine barrels. Um, but the most important, and um, as you say in the slide, indeed, um, each is unique, um, and this has to do also not because of their origin. Um, necessarily, but the most important thing for us is that each barrel over time gets their microflora of wild yeast from our beer. So by putting Lamic in the barrel after it was cooled down on the cool ship, inoculated with yeast on a cool ship, it will go into this fooder. First week you will see a fermentation very heavily. There will be foam being thrown out, so yeast being thrown out of the fooder uh, from the top. Um, and then afterwards, the beer will start aging in the, in, the, in the cask. It stays in there for up to three years. Um, and during all that time, you also have, from the previous time that there was lambic in there, a microflora of wild yeast in the cask, and this will interact with the lambic in there to help it age, to help create certain flavors. And then the size of the fooder, the type of oak, the, the thickness of the wood, the the how long you put lambic in there, how long lambic was in there the previous time, all these different factors will influence, and also for 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 a part the the history of the fooder will influence how the lambic will taste after one or two or three years. Um, typically, we will also get similar similar results in a certain way. These are nuanced differences. So if you taste this, you can definitely taste. Um, all these nuances very clearly if you're if you're a good taster um and this is why we also and this is what we're at least we're tasting i'm thinking i'm, I'm tasting the bat 91 right now by the way um <laughs> this was made with um 90 lambic from fooder so cask number 91 and um, so we can actually compare all these different casks if you would blend them uh or in, in what we call a mono blend which i'll explain a bit later but um yeah, we'll get there. We would, we would make them. We would make productions with blends of like four, five, six fooders together, create consistency this way uh, for our regular beers. Yeah. So when we talk, obviously we um, everyone knows what a goose is in terms of um, you know basic definition, right? It's a blend of different of different years of uh, aged lambics. Now you and uh, your father and brother have been very instrumental in in really uh, defining what makes an oud goose, correct? Yeah, yeah. So it, it's a beer. My, 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 when uh, in the in the 90s we actually got a, uh, a protection for the name oud goose 
how the means uh, traditional style or tradi traditional way. Mm -hmm. um, it's a production that also came along uh, not just like this. It's e in a production by the European Union, but this was also this was created because my father um, started um, started up a project to get this uh, to get this production. Um, so there was, if you look at, there's I actually have some beer books here at home where you can actually read this. There's a, these are beer books from the late '80s, and you read. Um, about uh, there's sections about different beer styles and then they would explain uh, lambic beer and gyoza and this is something I find fantastic to read today because they say um, there's only three traditional uh, gyoza producers left and this is a book from 1989 I think um, and they say it's Cantillon, Girardin and Bonne that's, and that's true but then it was the only three producers including us making a traditional gyoza as what we would define today as an Audi goose. And so all these these were these was, that were disappearing because there were um, like sort of more marginalized copies where they would sweeten the beer, they would add Pilsner, they would pasteurize it um, because and, and then blend it with lambic that's simply too acetic um, or acetic um, that just gives a lot of acidity in the beer. So by blending that with like Pilsner and, 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 and sweetening, it, sweetening it, it would be a s s sweet sour beer. Um, easy to drink, cheap to make, and you know, easy does to make. Does anyone police this? Does anyone Sorry? like? Does anyone police this in terms of like? I know there's a protection, so you cannot technically put yeah. yeah, on your so, label if you don't. So this is this is why in the 90s, my so in 1989, my father was already working this project, but the protection came mm -hmm. along in 1997, um, and to get to to police this as well to control this. Um, we have um, made an organization together with other blenders and brewers of Lambic beer. It's Horal, it is called. Um, mm -hmm. And from Horal, we continue this production. We keep specifying uh, things in this protection. So um, recently, we also specified a lot of things regarding um, not just what the ingredient should be and the production process, but also when you actually taste the beer, um, all these components like the beer should not be um, uh, it should not taste like vinegar, <laughs> basically. Um, it should have a certain uh, carbonation level, all these kind of things were defined. Um, and basically, as you say here, an Audi Goethe for, for how to make it, um, well, it's a blend of average 18 month old lambic, like our, out, our regular Audi Goethe would be um, about 40% uh, one year old, 40% two year old, and 20% three year old lambic. Um, our mariage parfait goes would be 90% three-year-old lambic and then 10% one-year-old. Um, and the one-year-old lambic, that the, the reason you blend this so that the one-year-old that contains sugars that are unfermented um, would actually uh, work together or, or, or active, reactivate the inactive yeasts in the older lambic that's three years old. And then this, this blend, this reactivation, you, you bottle it, of course, and then you get a bottle conditioning. This bottle conditioning is very important because then you also again you get you get carbonation, and in the beer you get foam, and that's important. If it's not foaming, if Goza needs to foam, I have a very good example here just to show uh, what it should look like. It's actually an, an advertisement sign, but this is basically if you pour a glass of Goza, a very big glass, but uh, you need you need foam. This is and it needs to stay there, and you need carbonation. Um, yeah. it, that is. If 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 lambic is if the goza lambic itself can be flat, but if goza is flat, it's 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 a, there's a problem, and you can't call it goza. It needs a, it needs a bottle fermentation. Also creates and that's probably the most important, even uh, more complexity, nicer flavors, balances it out. So if you taste lambic straight from barrels, it can be very nice. Of course, it's very very nice beer to taste, but it's even better when it's blended bottle conditioned and turned into it and how it goes and then you have the, you can make the most elegant beers that way so this is something that i didn't quite realize before we started importing um from you all of these actual def definitions especially you know that an oud goose must contain three-year-old beer in addition to or i guess on top of uh these ratios of you know 40 percent this 60 for that what what goes into actually choosing the fooder that you're going to age in? Because you have so many fooders and they are all so different. How do you, do you guys have ones? Do you have like a section of them that you blend in for, for the goose, some for the mirage parfait? Do you, 
do you ever change it yeah so there's there as i said there they we get again get uh, quite a lot of differences between the fooders but the the new the, the differences are mostly quite are, are, are nuances the base uh -huh. the because the base is is, is is somewhat the same but of course it means that the, the taste profile of a lambic can can be quite different from one fooder to the other um, and so when we're tasting um, fooders we taste about 12 fooders every Thursday afternoon each week um, just to keep up so if anyone's visiting the brewery you should go on Thursday afternoon <laughs> yeah, there's, there's, one, there's one special room where we're tasting uh, <laughs> um, and then yeah no the the the, the fooders what we're tasting is about we're, we're looking for about 35 to 40 variables um, that we're tasting judging on uh, some are just simple uh, objective things like uh, the bitterness um, would you uh, like this? would you taste diacetyl yes but these kind of things um, but there's also like subjective things like is this is this uh, a, a good taste for mariage parfait yes or no and so yeah. there's generally you can see there's a lot of fooders that are mostly used for the same beer uh, over time so like for mariage parfait there is generally uh, a, a certain range of fooders that are typically used of course when tasting we always check like do we get the taste so we do a blind tasting and like okay yes we get this taste and you just notice it's, it's that fooder but um these are the kind of things we're looking for um and 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 yeah it's it's a process of just you know weekly tasting and then of course also not just tasting but we do lab analysis of each sample um to check the fermentation degree alcohol uh sugar content all these things uh just to keep track of uh where the lambic is at yeah who it, who takes part in these tastings you joss and your and frank and your dad most um most most combinations it's it's my father and joss uh -huh. <laughs> and then um more and more today it's also me but um mostly it's it's, it's my father and joss and i'm tasting uh, mostly more when I have time. It's not every week when I'm tasting. Mm -hmm. I do more tastings of finished products. Um, so of course we taste all bottled before they are released too. Um, these are tastings that I do. Um, and then of course there's other tastings that we do of <laughs> keeping track of what's going on in the market as well. Um, That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, so one thing I everything, really sorry, but just to add, everything is for like limited editions. Um, like the, the the ones that we're tasting now, these are all uh, decisions that we make together. Like if there's one that, that really stands out, or that during one of the tastings they were like, yeah, this one is really special, then we're going to taste it together, put it maybe next to a few other a few others, and just compare and then decide like let's make a mono blend of this, yes or no, uh, or let's use it for this or that. Um, if it's something very very um, special, yeah. That's awesome. I guess I, I asked this question, but I do want to show these pictures because uh, when you go to the brewery, this is a, a picture I took when I was there. Uh, it's basically ancient hieroglyphics here on the on the fooders, and this is I assume that that Joss now knows this code. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. Who else? Do you know it? Yeah. Yeah. Can you read this? It's it's yeah, just I'm... letters and numbers. So these are these are what tasting notes. Yeah, so it's a bit too small to to me to I, be honest. I know. I won't ask you to. to it, will, it will start. It will start with a date. Um, in the middle, in the middle, you'll see. Uh, it's a funny one though. <laughs> in the middle, you see uh, rev rev eighteen. This just means that it needs to be the footer needs to be over. The, the the footer needs a fix in the year two thousand eighteen. So I think you took this picture probably uh, in September two thousand eighteen. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think it, fixed in, in November or, or October because we did actually fix number 64 <laughs> in that in that year um, the big a is the the brewing season um, and then on the top right the top right you will see some dates normally it's a bit unclear here but these are the dates that the footer was last cleaned and that's uh, most okay. where it's filled of course and then um, on the right side like the in the middle on the right you'll see some numbers these are the brew the the brew numbers of this brewing season so i think here you have 149 156 109 yeah it's possible uh from brewing season a in this footer 
Yeah. And and yeah, you can have different brews in one footer because one brew is 125 hectoliters, but the footer is all very in size. So you're already blending a little bit uh, in the start because you're brewing number, brew number one will fill up footer one, let's say, um, and then you, you will start filling up number two already a little bit. And then with the second brew, you'll continue filling number two. And so you're always a bit blending. So there's different brew numbers in one footer. Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> and this is obviously just moving a footer. Yeah, so that, that was actually um, lots of pressure not to drop it. <laughs> yeah, so th th that's a footer. That's one of the biggest footers that we have. It's um, a 240 hectoliter footer. Um, it's part of a series of 40 uh, footers that we have in one warehouse on the other side of the Zena River at our brewery. Um, those are 40 footers between 240 and 270 hectoliters each. So that's 10,000 hectos just in that warehouse um, of storage. In total, we have about 21,000 hectoliters of lambic uh, in oak footers. Um, but that, yeah, that cask is, is just, you know, and those casks, it's 40, 40 of them, they're just gigantic to stand in front. If I stand in front of it, my head will just be at the first, like, horizontal bar. <laughs> <laughs> have you... Uh... So what's this? So you mentioned cleaning. Have you ever been responsible for cleaning? Was that like a task of a ten-year-old, Carl? Uh, <laughs> uh, not of a ten-year-old, but uh, yeah, sure. Um, basically, when you're cleaning, and yeah, I, I, we've done this. It's um, you put a sort of high-pressure water system on the top of the footer. This goes around the cask um, in on the inside with hot water. Um, and then afterwards, and this is something I've done a lot, well, the, the, the high pressure thing, not always that much, but with smaller casks, when I was I was little, we had sm much more smaller casks. Mm -hmm. um, that was a task of burning uh, uh, sulfur inside of a barrel, just to get rid of all uh, the, any bacteria that may, or mold that may have entered to keep, to, to sterilize the cask on the, in, on the inside. Um, and you guys do all of this work yourself, right? You, you, like you um, clean, repair. Yeah, so at brewery, everything. Yeah, of course. So um, we we work on our footers ourselves, which makes sense, I think. Um, but we clean them ourselves, of course. But also all the maintenance that needs to be done. Um, we can take a footer. Up, uh, uh, we can break it up into different pieces, put it back together um, to repair. Um, so as so as you can see here, revision number eight, uh, 2018. This was one that we. Um, fixed the, the front side of this footer uh, in 2018 um, because there was too much pressure. Basically, on the front side, it needs to be like a bowl shape. Mm -hmm. And if the front side becomes too flat, you need to put um, on, the, on the, the, the hoops that are around the footer, you need to put pressure on this. So you probably need to shrink them, put more pressure on this, and then create this bowl shape. Like it's, it's, a, whole, it's a whole technique. But these things we, we can do, we, we actually do at our brewery ourselves. Um, because there's no cooperages in Belgium, so it's a, a trade that we have to, a craft that we have to do ourselves. Um, and it's something my father taught, was taught by his predecessor, and uh, he's teaching us and our employees. And so we have yeah. our own cooperage for that. Yeah. Just a picture of our group there, and this was actually us tasting through the discovery box for the VAT yeah. series, just there in the fooder hall. So go into a little bit of detail about what is this discovery box and why did you guys decide to to start doing it? Yeah, yes. so so the the the, the mono blends the, the 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 discovery box is consists of, of four mono blends and so a mono blend as I just said I'm tasting the VAT 91 uh, which is one of the four bottles in this box. Mm -hmm. um, the mono blends are it's a bit of a contradictory uh, word mono blend um, because we take 90% of one cask, and that is the point of the blend. It's just made up of 90% from one cask, and then okay. we will add 10% young lambic for the technical reason that we need refermentation in bottle. And of course, it's young lambic that will add the sugar, so we have this young lambic that will be there for uh, refermentation in bottle. But it consists for 90% of one footer, um, and then of course you will taste the character of that of that footer, of that cask. Um, and so we made a box of four bottles, all made from different footers, um, so you can compare. Um, and it's basically because we started doing this, uh, the, the, the discovery box was, I think these were bottles five to five, six, seven, 
eight. So on, in the series, we made four other ones before this, but all these were all separate releases um, starting in 2013, I think. Um, yeah, 2013. Um, and it was, it's basically because people came to our brewery and they, they pointed at the cask and said, can I taste that, but can I taste it at home? <laughs> And we're like, yeah, but it's it's lambic straight from the barrel at home. It's a bit difficult, but then it got us thinking like, yeah, it would be nice if we could just make a Gerza like that to just show the characteristics of a fooder. And then, so, yeah, we started doing that series and Discovery Box uh, followed as well. Um, and the point is every time we will select very specific fooders, which for us have very typical characteristics that stand out or and indefinitely in the, in the discovery box we made a selection where there are certain certain ones that stood out especially um i think the 91 the first one that we're, that we're tasting here um that one is maybe pro probably the, the more the more basic um one the one that shows like this is a very good high quality goose but very balanced very subtle and then you go all the way up to the 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 108 which is probably for in our own opinion maybe a bit too um aesthetic um but still very balanced and still quite elegant so it, it's a nice twist and and you, you can taste all this and it has it has to do with with the with the casks but the night because the nice thing with this discovery box is that all these lambics were brewed in the same brewing season so it's same recipe mm. same brew house same ingredients from the I same conditions exactly same all these conditions are the same just the cost was different we even bottled all four in the same week so we have wow. eight going on now um, all these four bottles have the same age so it's very interesting so even for me today i'm, I'm tasting all four now um just to taste all four again because they were bottled this is really important these were bottled in on the on the week of i see 91 was 19th of December 2016. So these are bottled in December 2016. Here. So if I count right, three and a half years in bottle now. Most beers would be very, very, very bad to drink at that point. <laughs> not, not out of good. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm going to launch a poll right now for everyone here just to get an idea um, of what everyone's drinking right now. Right. If someone says New England IPA, um, get out. <laughs> <laughs> You've come to the wrong webinar. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, you let's see. What here is. <laughs> okay, so Carl, just because I, I didn't run this by you yesterday, here are the options. So I have either Bone Framboire Creek, the Mariage Parfait, one of the VAT series, uh, sorry, no Boone in the house, I'm drinking another Lambic, which nobody said that, so great job, everyone. Uh, and 25% of the people say they have no beer in sight, which is sad. Uh, wow. So it is you only- You guys say now and buy beer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it looks like, oh, a few people did say they didn't have any Boone, they're drinking a Lambic, though. I We are at a tie for the, the Mariage Parfait. Oh, the yeah. Mariage Parfait. It's in, it's crazy because I can see it live. So it looks like Mariage Parfait is winning. 27% nice. of people are in Mariage Parfait. Okay, I'm gonna close this now. So uh, let's go on to really the reason why we're here, 50 minutes in, <laughs> to, oh, take, <laughs> to take through each vat. So um, this is a live shot of the that number 91 and the this fooder originally came from normandy correct originally held calvados exactly so as i just said this this was a this is a oh i'll just go into the fooder quick, quickly first so this this fooder was originally need used uh, for calvados so this is distilled cider um in the in normandy um in france uh, we've been using this fooder today for 20 Three years at the brewery. Uh, so when the beer was bottled, this beer was made, the Fat 91, it was about 20 years at the brewery. Um, so already it's been used for quite a bit of uh, yeah. productions of, of Lambic. So you have a nice sprank culture on the inside. Um, the Calvados fooder is actually, because this is part of a, a series, we have a, a whole bunch of these Calvados fooders. Um, after 20 years, we noticed you really started getting uh, to a point where 
they were getting ideal for aging lambic two years and three years. Uh, so we made the VAT91 to as part of the box to show like, look, this is a very nice, this should be a very nice, and, and it turns out to be this way as well, which is always nice to see when you're trying to do something. Um, this should be, and this has become uh, a very nice, subtle, but characterful uh, out of goods. So it's uh, very subtle, not too extreme in a certain way. Um, when you taste it, there's, there's a lot of body. Um, you have some oakiness, some some um, some light bitterness, but nothing, not 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 no weird, uh, not too funky flavors, uh, if you will. Um, slightly smoky and so on, and a bit like as you see in the in the graph here, um, the fruitiness perhaps I would say today is a bit less, and that was perhaps a bit more uh, when it was younger. Um, but this is just of course the aging. Today I taste that the aging is going really well. You get this the smokiness, the breath character really becoming more present, which is very nice for me personally. I have quite a bit of bottles of the 91 in my cellar just for that reason, because it's a very subtle, easy drinking, for me at least, easy drinking, uh, smoky, a little like whiskey-like uh, uh, goes uh, in that perspective comparable to the Mariage Perfect, actually. Absolutely. I think the last time when I tried these uh, in, it would have been 2018. Uh, yeah. So they were about two years old, a year and a half old. Uh, I know, I believe my favorite was the 108. So I'm interested to see how they, how they stack up today. Uh, yeah. Do you have a favorite? Does your dad, well, does your brother have a favorite? Well, I'm just going to start opening the next one already. It's 92. Uh -huh. And this was actually my favorite from the start. And I think my brother, my father's favorite as well. Um, the, the day we, we, we tasted all four next to each other for the first time, that was in May of 2017. Uh, you have to know that we released the beers to market in September 2017. So in May we tasted all four for the first time next to each other, and we had this. It's a bit funny maybe, and and we did the joke recently with it, even in a collaboration with a, a Danish uh, brewer. Uh, but um, we said like, yeah, 92. That is fantastic. That's the one, 92. And then I tasted 108, and I said yes, and this is gonna be the one for the American beer drinker. <laughs> and I was and I was absolutely right because uh, I noticed that a lot of um, more American uh, beer drinkers preferred that one, probably because it's a bit more uh, pronounced and extreme in, in a like, sour way. <laughs> um, and it's a bit typical perhaps, um, but it also- well, Nothing's uh, we, not predictable, huh? <laughs> sorry? I said, I'm nothing if not predictable, huh? <laughs> you know, uh, you have to know your markets, and then you know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> we we also won quite a bit of awards with it with the VAT 108, which which also led us, by the way, to make a second 108. I'm quickly going to show this, although it's not really yet out there. Um, I have a bottle here. This is the 108. It's a bit unclear. This. Uh, wait. The white and the gold. It's beautiful. White and gold. But this is new since this year. I'm just showing this like really quickly, just as a teaser. Um, but the 108 was a, was has won a quite a bit of awards as well. Um, but now for me today, um, the challenge is really um, 92 was my favorite, um, but aging um, made the 110 very good as well. And I'm gonna compare these two. Um, yeah. That was interesting because the 110 had a nice oak body that really started coming coming together nicely in the, in the whole taste of the beer. So you can only taste to know the results. Shout out to <laughs> Damon for taking this uh, beautiful shot of you with the Puder 92. Yeah, so that's a, a cask. Let me just explain a little bit about that footer. Um, cheers, by the way. Um, cheers. cheers to everyone. Fantastic aroma. So this is a red yeah. wine footer from the Rhone Valley in France. Um, this was used, well, we've been using it now for I think we may use it for VAT 92 
we're using it for about 10 or 15 years at the brewery. What's your youngest fruiter? The youngest one is a new one that we made in 2015, which you actually have on the picture. Uh, the, yeah, 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 the fresh oak, yeah. got it. Yeah. So the 92 was, was, was also a very subtle one, but like it has just as much more body, more expressive, a little bit more oakiness and so on. And it just got this, it just was this much, this this, this step of, of like just a little bit more of the good stuff compared to the 91, where the 91 was already fantastic. The 92 just had this even more. Now I'm tasting after like, um, I haven't tasted all four next to each other for a while so it's very interesting now to compare the combination is still beautiful it's still great yeah it's fantastic though i can't say i'm drinking out of the, the correct I, I have to say it's in, interesting to taste how, how this one mellowed out even more over time compared to the 91 where you have this breath character and smoking as being pronounced even more over time the 92 has become even more like like wow. i would describe it as mellow um mm -hmm. I really like it. It's very smooth. Probably it's, it, it's a bit of like a, 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 a more more fruity as well. Yeah. Very interesting to taste this uh, after three and a half years in model. How often do you guys taste bottles? I'm assuming you're, you sell her quite a bit. How often do you kind of go through and see how things uh, are aging? In well, the okay. Yeah. Well. Um, we we taste quite uh, quite a lot. Um, so we do just at the brewery for regular production follow up. We taste every batch before it releases uh, goes out the brewery. It needs to be all right. We have a system in this for certain beers for for every beer that's bottle conditioned. So the out of goes out of keek. We will do this very regularly in about like um, two weeks after bottling, two months after bottling, four months, six months, and so on. We keep um, bottles for a longer time to follow up on evolution. After a certain time, we stop systematically tasting um, because, of course, you can only just keep up with so much. Um, but we do tastings from time to time of, like, let's say, 40 bottles of, of, of just out of Goethe. And then we go with bottles that are a couple of years old all the way up to a few months and then just compare all these productions and this, this would be a series of maybe all the productions that we did of this beer uh in all that time and just to follow up on well production differences you always have some batch differences because it's still blending and so on that you're doing so there's always some batch differences mm -hmm. um, but also um, tests that we do to imp improve certain things um it's all small details but we can follow up on all this uh, but that would that stuff we also do uh let's say once a month maybe um we do, do you like have a max, especially now when so many people are going through their cellars and opening stuff, do you have a time period where you're like, you should drink it before it gets to the five-year mark, 10-year mark? Mm, well, there is like no, actually there is no really, um, there's not really a moment where we say like, now you have to drink it or it's going to go bad. We don't really have that. Um, Certainly, with how bottles are filled today and, and, and closed today, the corks are of very high quality. Um, uh, there's definitely old bottles out there that are maybe, you know, too late. You probably should have drank them, um, but it has to do with uh, technological reasons of 20 years ago or before. Um, but now, no, really, um, if, if, if we want to drink, it goes at a good point. Um, like a general rule, I would say, after two years of bottle conditioning, you're probably at a good point. Um, where you really get it's not it's not the high point of the beer but it's like if you put it into a graph the quality goes up very fast in the first two years uh -huh. it, the, the evolution is very fast and after two years it kind of like bends but then the evolution still keeps on going but just not as fast and that's and so after two years you're at a nice point and if you wait longer if you're patient enough you can get even better or but even then, it's still some. It's it's still personal preference as well. I mean, sometimes people just like the beer more fresh. It's like a, a typical example with Orval. Uh, it's it's a, a beer that that people like. Oh, I like it six months. I like it at two years and so on. Right. Um, but then it's different. Simply in that one, for example, it's the difference between when it's fresh. You have the typical um, dry hopping of that beer, and after two years, after six months, even already, you get the nice typical red character of the beer. 
and mm -hmm. if someone likes this, the other person likes that. It's a little bit with beer, lambic beer as well. Like after a time, you get red character even more. Um, it's personal preference as well. And we're by the time by the time beer gets from your bottling line to us here in the states, we're at about six months, anyways, four yeah. to six months. Yeah. Yeah. For for outer girls, you would probably be at six months minimum. Uh, the black labels we keep them at the brewery for uh, one year. Black label number four, which we released in December, which is still uh, which still has to go to the U.S., uh, mm -hmm. was kept at the brewery for two years before being released, um, just because we wanted to age it a bit longer. Uh, yeah. So we actually went to all the, two to two years, so you don't have to wait. We waited for you. <laughs> Uh, because there's definitely people who's, who tell us like I bought a case I wanted I wanted to put it away but it, I emptied it quicker than I could resist. <laughs> no, <I just> <laughs> <laughs> um, we have a solution for this: buy more. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, but it's it's not always possible, of course. But but uh, no, it, generally for all conditioned beers, it's it's that much. Then for for cake and for framboise, which are um, not bottle conditions, they're centrif centrifuge before being bottled, so they're not pasteurized either, but it's just centrifuge, mm -hmm. so you don't get conditioning. Those you probably need to drink as, as fast as possible, and they, yeah. they will arrive at the, in the States, I think, three months to four months after being bottled, something like that. And correct me if I'm wrong, the Mariage Parfait Creek is the, the is has the oldest beer blended into it by the time it leaves the brewery, correct? Yeah, the Mariage Rapé Creek is, is like the, is the oldest beer when it leaves the brewery. So you have a beer that is, um, to just a few words on cake. So when you make, when we make creek, so cherry uh, beer, we will a, we will ferment whole, whole fruit, so cherries, with one-year-old lambic. This will ferment together for a couple of weeks, and this will make cherry lambic. So then you have this, cherry lambic. So to make Mariage Parfait Creek, we will take the cherry lambic and blend together with three-year-old lambic uh, and a two-year-old lambic, mostly. Blend this together, and instead of bottling it and, age, and blending it with one-year-old lambic, instead of bottling it, we will age it another six months in a fooder, specific fooders for Creek Mariage Parfait, um, to give it some more oak character, um, it, it, it really pushes it more towards like wine rather than, than beer when you're tasting it. Um, but it means that it's being bottled after the six months. And then you need another four months, preferably six months of bottle conditioning. So when the oldest, the oldest part of beer in there is four years old when it leaves the brewery. Right. And every right. step in all the four years needs to be right, otherwise you have a beer that's not okay. So you need to do everything just right to get that to get that beer tasted splendidly. Perfect. Yeah. Uh okay, I got us sidetracked here, but let's go on to the 110. So you prefer to do the 110 before yes. the 108, correct? Exactly. Now I'm very, I'm, I'm very much looking forward now. So I'm opening the bottle now. I really want to compare this one to the 92 um, because 110 is made, um, and some of you might notice. Um, so you have um, VAT 109 as well, which was a previous one that we released. Um, the 109 is like a, a sister or a brother uh, cask compared to the 110. It's the same type of cask, same history, and so on. Um, so it was used for um, a con as a cognac storage, storage barrel. Um, and the day we started using them, 2009, um, we shaved the inside of the fooder because otherwise you would have too much of the cognac character. So we shaved out uh, oak on, on the inside. So we got to like the bare uh, oak. Um, and then we put lambic in there. And you really get, and after a couple of times filling it and then using it for the VAT 109 and now the VAT num food number 110 for VAT 110. Um, you, put, you, put in fresh, you put in fresh beer in there or Lambic that had already been aged? Uh, no, so, so uh, war, so, so Lambic was okay. just beer. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so this, this really gives us uh, a beer where you get a nice oak, uh, oak uh, character. Struggling with the 
to the to water. Hang on, oh, there we go. <laughs> um, but this was a nice, a very nice uh, uh, beer, but it was not as good as a 92, in my personal opinion, in May 2017. Now, over all this time, I noticed it was aging very well, and so this was like my the one that may be the new favorite uh, for me personally. <laughs> We shall see. Yes. Either way, it's serving perfectly. Just get a coaster. So you see, this is brightly served. Very important, by the way, when serving goods is don't shake the bottle, don't put it too cold, don't put it too cold in your fridge. Room temperature, like well, no, not room temperature, but like. Fahrenheit, uh, like 54, 56 degrees Fahrenheit, like that's the correct temperature for serving this beer. And you can serve it like clear, and you can see it's 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 clear. Um, it's not a hazy beer either. Uh, you don't serve the the the, the sediment of the beer. Um, it needs to be served like this, and serve and and pour it, you know, gently. Don't chuck the bottle away in the in the glass. Just gently do this and take your time. We, we, we took our time to make it as well, so. Ah, fantastic. <laughs> yeah, so the O character of the of the of these cuts has really been pronounced even more over all this time. It's very nice. Yeah, more a bit more like phenolic effect of uh, some smoky effect like you have in whiskey. Very whiskey like, right? Very. This is my favorite so far. Yeah, exactly. And this is this is what I mean. I think this is now my new favorite <laughs> of, the, uh, of these four. Uh, this is a, this is a very good effect. And this is what you get with these scooters with the Fat 110 and the Fat 109 as well, which we which we had previously, which is even older now. Um, but I tasted the 109 recently, and I can com I can say they're very comparable. Um, in the, in the way they age, and you have mm -hmm. this, this O character really getting and, and, and giving some vanilla hints there, which is, you get get some clear vanilla notes from from the oak, making it um, somewhat like it gives a sort of like a sweet suggestion, maybe a warm suggestion, but it's it's very nice, it's very pleasant. Yeah, this is something I can enjoy uh, honestly uh, all day. Yeah. Yeah. To a fault, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah, this one is beautiful. You know, it's only 12.15 here. It's only noon in Los yeah. Angeles, but this may be the bottle I finished today, I think. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we still have one last one, though. I do have, we have a question. If anyone has questions, you can put it in the question box. I apologize, because I'm clearly having trouble flipping between this PowerPoint and the questions, but uh, Shahan, has a tricky question here. Okay. Hello. Uh, Carl, you had said that Fooder 64 was fixed in 2018. How many Fooders, this is more of a quiz than a question, can you remember off the top of your head, could you list all of the Fooders that have three-year-old Lambic right now? Uh, <laughs> that seems pretty impossible, Shahan, to ask, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I, I keep track of the Fooders, but it's <laughs> Shahan, you're asking a difficult question there. Um, I guess on average, how many, you know, how many? Yeah, on how many? Ten percent like of your fooders that have three-year-old lambic in it at any one time. Um, I imagine. But. Like between five and ten percent, rather. It's it's we have maybe, I think, well, I, I, but the the coronavirus will help us to have more aged lambic. That's for sure. Uh, yeah. But I think right now we'll have about ten ten fooders with three-year-old lambic. Okay. Uh, we just had one with actually with four-year-old lambic. Even the one we kept for some some time. Yeah, it's it's a special reason we made a, a mono blend with it, of course, number thirty-one. But this is one is bottled actually um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, and we will probably release it only in a year or maybe two years. We'll see. So that one, that thirty-one. Keep an eye out for it, but only in like one or two years. <laughs> <laughs> What's the longest you've let it go? You let a fitter age for. Oh, uh, for four Without years. Was not longest we've done it. Yeah, simply because if, at a certain point there is only 
in our, generally, it's not a good idea to do four years. Um, there's only a few reasons why you could do it, um, and it has to do with with the the wood of the of the barrel. At a certain point, the 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 fermentation, the aging rather, um, slows down so much. The yeasts, you know, they've been working on the beer for all this time, but the, the, there's nothing in the beer anymore to to transform. I mean, they they work on on, on sugars in the beer. If there's nothing left, there's nothing to do. They get inactive, they die. Um, and if, if they get inactive, well, it's still a, an oak barrel. Um, in, you have um, still oxygen coming in from the outside through the wood. And normally, when the yeasts are active, they would also consume this oxygen, so it wouldn't oxidize the beer. But of course, if the beer, the yeast get inactive, and there's oxygen coming in, you get, you would have oxidation going on. And this is not not what we want, of course. Um, but in a certain in certain cases, um, I can't say why. <laughs> Technical reasons. We still keep some secrets. Um, <laughs> but in some some cases, and it really has to do with technical reasons because of the wood. Uh, technical reasons of the footer, the way it's built. Um, you would have less oxygen pickup, uh, less possibilities for oxygen to come in, even slower fermentation over time. And then you can age longer. And so with this now, we allowed it to happen now once with this one footer where we really got some nice tastes. Awesome. How many different types of wood do you use for the brewery? Is everything oak? All, all oak. Everything. But it's different varieties of oak. You have generally French oak, but there's also um, yeah, there's oak from, from different regions, but more sig most significantly it's it's the French oak and then um, for a few foodies that are quite special, they really give some very, very good lambic. Um, it's 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 foodies that were the oldest ones actually, the number seventy nine, for example. Um, it's it's uh, these were made with what we call it Prussian oak. So this was oak from the northern Polish region today, um, Prussia uh, in the past. Um, so like where the the very the Germans. Mm -hmm. Their, the Prussian German uh, culture comes from. Um, from that region, you have like what we call northern oak, and it's oak that were, grew very slowly, um, has very thin veins, it's like strong as steel, uh, really good food. These, these casks, you don't need to fix them very often because this, this oak is just of such good quality. Um, and of course, also for the beer, you really taste the, 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 yeah, the difference. But uh, yeah, so most significantly French oak, and then for those who are also the Prussian oak, and there's a couple of other things in there, but it's it's more like coincidental. Um, yeah. Okay, we've got the last one here. Of course, I'm going to open that. One too. Yeah. So the 108. Um, that's that's the only fo uh, only footer in this. Discovery box that actually comes from another brewery before. And it held what, like Pilsner, or it was just like a holding no. tank? No, so the 108 was used for a sort of uh, uh, like like Flemish red ale, um, like out out bread. Yeah. If it rings a bell, um, this type of beer. So these are beers that are typified with high uh, acetic acidity. Um, and you still taste it <laughs> in in the beer, and and apparently, and that's why I said like this is what uh, the, the American the Americans are going to like. <laughs> it's not extreme. I, I was no, but it's it's a little bit more pronounced, and I know this is like um, this is more of a, a, a this is a, in the taste. I notice this is more like uh, more appreciated. Uh, on the other side of the Atlantic, um, here in Belgium, this is not as much appreciated. It's then it's also liked, um, but more by the beer geeks. Or like for, and it's it has to do with what you said about you know people drink this beer like every day in a bar here. It's it's because this the the acidity is just this much higher. It becomes less um, easily drinkable. Um, you don't just drink a glass of it and say like, yeah, let's have another one, another round for the table. You don't do it with this beer um, because the taste doesn't really allow it. But it's still interesting and, and, and still quite balanced, elegant, and so on. 
But of course, now I'm going to pour the glass myself. And let's see what, uh, what it says. Well, while we are drinking this, I'm going to launch our next poll for everyone, which is, now that we're on the last one, which is your favorite bat for everyone here today? Definitely still more acidic, certainly. Yeah, and it's interesting because it's actually now over time, the acidity, but it's what you would expect um, of, a, of a, our goods that's well made. It's mellowed out. It's smoother, but I have the impression it's it's camouflaging a couple of things in the beer that 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 are otherwise um, that would be more uh, that you can taste better in in, in a few of the other uh, bats that we're tasting right now. So you get some really it's it, yeah. You know, the acidity it's it's not as acidic as as it used to be, which is which is good, which is a good evolution. But my personal favorite will be the 110. Me too, actually. We're in agreement on there. And as is most, so collecting our poll responses, um, we've got nobody for the 91. Uh, looking like the 110 was almost everyone's fave. The 92 comes in a very close second. Yeah. And a handful of people can't decide because they're all so good. Are you uh, guys? Voting and, 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 and doing what I said. I mean, have, you can have your own opinion. It's no problem. If you like 108, don't don't hesitate. We've got a few people on the 108. Ah, there you go. It's definitely the only one where you kind of feel that that like uh, characteristic like tartness in your jaw a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, and that's something that normally normally we're we we would avoid in our beers. I mean, this is a a, a cask that we well actually now we use it second time for the 108 bis, um, and now we actually took apart that cask. It's certainly going to serve as a spare parts for other fooders because there were some technical difficulties with this cask. Um, but the the the, the lemon used from this cask before that actually served as like. Um, Imagine it like this, if you're in a kitchen and you're using salt and pepper and you're cooking, it's a bit like giving this extra punch to, to your blend, in our case. Um, it's, like, it's, it's, it's giving this extra character in a small dose. Um, as a mono blend, it's more expressive. So it's And that's, of course, why we made it with the Discovery Box, because it teaches you and shows you a little bit like what, what we have in, in the cask. But of course, and then maybe I can come to another point. Um, it allows you to, if you have all four bottles in front of you, and if you're crazy enough to do it, make your own blend. You can actually blend these these gurzes together in one glass and, and just play a little bit with, with the characteristic. I mean, the 108 is perfect as, like, you, you that at 10% uh, with the 92, for example. Suddenly your 92 will be even 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 more expressive the body will be uh, you know it, it's 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 a little bit how it works um yeah but that's, it's that's a true a, art form as much as like it people are right to romanticize it right it is it is really truly an art form and it's so nice that we have these boxes now that or, that you guys have released them that you can really try and taste these nuances because they're certainly not i mean i'm no professional palate so for me I would enjoy all of these on their own, right? If I had one bottle, I'm just tasting them, but to really be able to taste them side by side is what makes this this whole experience really cool. Exactly. That was the point. That was the idea. You succeeded there. Uh, okay, so I just want to show one last uh, snapshot. Now this is the 79 here, which is the oldest. Yeah. Correct. I think we kind of. On the bottom left, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Bottom left. But very impressive. And I've not seen the new store, the new like food hall across the river, right? I think you were just, were you just building that when the last time I was there? Or it was like, uh, plans? yeah, we were, we were working on it. Um, if it's, it's, 
we were working on it. It was a um, it's it's like an old building where we were setting this up, and so we started to fix quite a bit of things with the building itself as well. While we were putting in the the casks, um, it was a bit of a mess. Basically, we didn't show it because it was just a bit of a mess. Um, that really didn't look as beautiful as you can see on the <laughs> here. Um, but now now it probably if the next time you guys are coming over, you can definitely see it as well. It's a uh, it's quite an impressive sight to see. Cool. Well, I'm going to open it up to um, everybody joining us here. Just going to uh, escape here for a second uh, and see if anybody has any questions before we finish up. Now's your time to ask. I think I, I definitely answered most people's uh, during the presentation itself. Um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to, to shoot us an email too if you don't get it in time here. But uh, thank you so much, Carl, for joining us here. It's yeah, great no to problem. see you. Hopefully we will see you next year and we'll get that seventh uh, gold medal under your belt. <laughs> well, you know, we, it is, the competition is always getting stronger. Um, there's always definitely good beers, not, not just from our brewery coming out there. So we'll see. Um, of course, I cross my own fingers, but it would be an incredible uh, accomplishment if we would do that. But if, if, if someone else would grab it the next time, then of course, perhaps it would be logical because, you know, we're not the only ones making good beers either. There's still good, beer, <laughs> good beers being made by others too. But of course, we're crossing our fingers for a seventh one. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, cool. Thank you so much. Thank uh, everyone who joined us today. Definitely appreciate you being here. Um, wishing all the best to our wholesaler partners as well as all of our retailer partners here, both on and off premise, as we kind of uh, you know, figure out these times together. So uh, we will hopefully see you soon. We're gonna take a little bit of a break before our uh, next webinar. We do have uh, webinars planned a little bit in the future with Stiegel, Shimei, and Silly again. Um, but until then, we really appreciate your support. Thank you so much. And thank you, Carl. Have a good night, buddy. Yeah, you too. Okay, bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.